All right, so this is the World Championship debrief. Daniel made it back. He's alive, but I don't think he's very well at the moment. Yeah, so um, just to, in case you guys were not aware, obviously, this is a follow-up. So this will be like the epilogue of Road to West Virginia because I qualified for the World Championships. And I flew out to Tahoe this last weekend and ran on Sunday. It's currently Wednesday, so I got and I got back yesterday morning, which was Tuesday at about 10 a.m. in the morning. I caught a red eye back, so uh, a lot of excitement going on, a lot of tired, uh, you know, fatigue yeah. in I, me still. But I apparently really missed out by not going to this one. Yeah, but I got to hang out with Einstein here all weekend, so that was nice. But yeah, I uh, I think we I'll just kind of discuss all of it. So so you guys just saw all of the race content. You guys probably have some questions about particular things that are going on. So it might be good to answer some of those questions that I think are gonna come up and just talk about the race. Um, but yeah, so this is the 2019 World Championships. I qualified in my age group, which is 18 to 24 this year. But yeah, so we got to the start of the race line. I was kitted out in this full like face mask, everything ready to go. And we started our ascent. My game plan was not to run at all on the uphill because I knew I was gonna be so tired for the rest of the race that I should just efficiently power hike and try and make it to the top of the hill using as little energy as possible so I could save it for efficient downhilling, efficient flat running, stuff like that. And then the second uphill, I was just gonna see how I felt before I decided if I wanted to run. So that was kind of my game plan, but we got to the part where we were hiking and the first few obstacles are fine. Like I said, uh, I remember warming up, and I told Mike this earlier, but I was I was hot in the venue area. I was actually a little warm, even though it was really cold outside just because I was wearing three layers and I was running. So I was generating a good bit of heat. And so going up the hill, I felt fine. We came to like over walls and a six foot wall. I, I planned my nutrition to take my first uh, back of nutrition halfway up the mountain at water station two. When I got there, it was closed because all the water had frozen through. Yeah. It had all frozen solid. And so you could not get any water there. We did bucket carry. I actually ran the downhill on the bucket. So I was feeling fine. Then you went up some steps, you did bender, which was just a formality, and then the spear throw. And I got up there and the wind was exactly like <laughs> going side to side, yeah. perpendicular to, watch. Um, to the direction you were throwing the spear. And I remember thinking in my head, should I adjust for the wind or shouldn't I? Because if you adjust and you didn't need to, you're, you're, you're pretty likely to miss because I already at, sometimes throw a little less left. So when I throw down the center, I'll either hit the center or aim left. I very, very rarely throw too far right. So I thought, no, I shouldn't adjust. How bad could the wind <laughs> push it? So I got ready, I chucked the spear, and you can see it didn't just barely miss to the right. It flew off to the right. I, there was a lot of wind yeah. when we got to the top. I believe they said it was a minus 19 wind chill, minus 19 degrees wind chill yeah. at the top of the mountain. That's how fast the wind was going. It was blisteringly fast. If, if I left the audio on on the GoPro, you could just hear it whipping. Um, but that was disappointing. I remember watching the coverage later. I feel less bad about missing it because when you're looking at the names who missed that spear throw, it was a lot. Ryan Woods, who was in first at the time, missed the spear throw, fell off, never saw him again. I think he got like fifth, uh, fourth or fifth. Did Ryan Kent miss his, I think? I think basically everyone up front. Yeah. And if you didn't miss, you podium. Yeah, uh, Robert Killian won. Uh, John Alban missed, but he fought his way back to third. Yeah. Um, but just like huge names in Spartan. The previous world champion missed the spear throw. And then on the girl women's side, Lindsey Webster, missed her spear throw right behind Nicole Miracle who hit it. So not only did Miracle, who was already a little ahead of her win, but Webster missed, flew all the way back. Face Stenning, I believe, missed it. Just pretty much all these popular names. So I felt, I did not feel bad at all about missing oh, the yeah, spear. No. The brutal thing about the spear was not the burpees, it was the burpee zone. So you can see it on the footage, but basically there's a huge hill right behind the burpee zone and there is a white tape box and people kept trying to do burpees outside of the box. And, and the volunteers kept having to say, no, you have to be inside the tape. And they knew that people were trying to get out because the burpee zone was miserable. It was pretty much where all the runoff of the snow melting all drizzled down into this pit. So it was just this cold, it was ice cold water, super muddy, 
soak through. So by the time I got done with my burpees, my entire front side was numb. I got to multi-rig. I did forget to record myself going through multi-rig. It's one of the few obstacles. It was one of the only two obstacles I missed on the entire race. And then ape hanger. So ape hanger was, I, was one of the obstacles I was dreading the most. Mostly because last year when I did it, the, the metal bars had gotten really wet from all the open people getting on and kind of just soaking the, the grips on it. So I was concerned about it being wet and then also anything that has water when you're at the top of the mountain and the wind's blowing like that, you're just concerned about it being cold. So I got in, I, I specifically kept my hands clean, immediately grabbed the rope and climbed up. And I actually, I felt pretty good going through it. Um, it wasn't the easiest obstacle in the world. Uh, like I definitely noticed I was doing work to finish it, but I don't think I was in danger of failing. Actually at the end, you can see in the video, I kind of let go with one hand. I just like give the camera guy a thumbs up who was taking photos there. So did you get the photo out of it? They did not post that photo. Aww. They posted the photo of me going through it, but not the one of me like hanging with a yeah. thumbs up. That's sad. He, he even told me, he said, that's a really good photo. You'll want to you'll go look for yeah. it. So I did and it's not there, but oh well. Yeah. We did that, and then I remember saying to the guy next to me, he's like, let's just get out of this hellhole. <laughs> and, so, and we started descending. And I started feeling really good. I said, you know, so, so on Ape Hanger, I fell back a little bit, and my back had gotten a little cold, yeah. and my front was still wet. So at this point, my clothes were kind of just soaked at this point already. And, but I, I was running, and I felt warm. And then we saw the sandbag carry. And this is where the race started falling apart for me. Because the sandbag carry was a double sandbag carry. And if the guys can be believed, it was two 80 pound sandbags that we had to carry mm. on that black diamond ski slope. I was told the total weight was 160. Yeah. That, that's what I was told. So the difficult thing about the sandbags were, was not the weight. It was the fact that it's hard to balance two sandbags, one on each shoulder. So I had one sandbag on one shoulder, and then the other one kept slipping off while I was trying to put the other one. And I would stumble. I almost fell down the half pipe at one point, trying to put them both on. Yeah. And at one point, I, I pretty much just gave up. I threw one over my shoulder, and I just carried the other one like a baby. And that was, that was my strategy through the whole thing. And I got to the bottom really quickly, obviously, but then going up, I think I stopped five or six times. I, and that's where it started hitting me, because the first, like the second or third time I stopped, I was fine. The fourth time I stopped, I remember, I could feel myself starting to lock up. And that's where it starts getting dangerous because you're cold and it's just getting colder as you stand still and you have to keep moving to generate energy. But yeah, I, I remember just thinking, yeah, this is really rough, but I, I'll try to survive. So I think after five or six stints of walking up the hill, I finally reached the top, deposited the bag, and I was frigid, just locked up completely at this point. I, I was not functioning well anymore just because I stopped. So if it were a single sandbag carry, I probably could have walked almost nonstop up the hill. Yeah. It was the fact that I completely stopped moving and had to wait for 30 seconds before it's trying again. Yeah, I got you. And you're just standing still on the mountain. And the wind's still whipping. Mm -hmm. I forget about the wind. Yeah, the Where wind had settled out a little bit on the slope, but it was, so it wasn't as bad as at the top, but it still yeah. was not good. And then I started running downhill and I thought, okay, just get into a good headspace, the swim is coming. And at this point, I was so soaked through, I thought, if I take my clothes off, I might actually lock up. It might be better just to go. So I grabbed my life vest. I, again, this is the other obstacle I missed. I forgot to record the swim. I, after I realized that, I turned around and got a shot of the swim just as I was leaving. But I did not get anything. But I thought, there's no point in taking anything off. Just go. So I remember I got to the edge, I got my shins in the water, and there was a guy next to me who, he had been there for like 15 seconds, just staring at the water. Yeah, I, I pointed to him, it was like, hey, three, two, one, and then we both jumped in the water at the same time. And I remember how cold it felt last year. It day. was cold. It was the coldest I have ever been in water before. It was ice cold. And this is where it started getting really bad, because I told Mike there were three points in the race where I got so cold I thought about quitting. The first one was, it was the sandbag carry when the first chill started hitting me. The second was in the swim. I almost called out for help in the middle of the swim to have someone come get me. And I just, I knew in my head I could do it. You know, the, the mind always gives up before the body, that whole thing. Yeah. But it was, it, it was so cold that the thought kept, came into my head. 
it, it came in as like a very strong voice saying, call out for help and it will all be over. Ugh. And I just remember, honestly, one of the big things is the guy told me the photo was so cool. I was like, if I dig it up, I won't get the photo. <laughs> I right. need to finish. <laughs> so Whatever I, works, dude. Yeah. But I got out and I didn't even stop to put on, to put anything for warmth on. I just started running because I knew I needed to generate heat. And eventually I came down to a turn where there were a bunch of trees and we were really sheltered from the wind. And I said, I'm having a hard time. Just my hands are so cold. I can't physically grab things without stopping. So I stopped there and I got my trash bags and I put the trash bags on. So I just poked a head hole in a trash bag and put it on and I did not take it off for the rest of the race. And I was not functioning. So I remember on the downhill, I, my vision started blurring to the point like, like it wasn't like things were unfocused but you know when you're watching something and the frame rate's real low and there's motion blur? Yeah. It was that, but real life. Just as I was walking down this hill, the rocks and things were blurring as I was running. And every single time I would step, I'd just jostle a little bit. And I knew I was in serious trouble then. And there's, yeah. there's one obstacle called the low crawl, which is at, at about a little less than halfway down the mountain. Uh, going up, you went over this bridge. And coming back down, you crawled under it. And I crawled under the bridge, and I had a momentary break from the wind. And I remember I got under there, and I told Mike this, but I, the, the voices in my head were just like, stop, just crawl up here and take a nap. <laughs> Which is like a stage of late, this, that's yeah, a sign of late stage died. hypothermia. There was, a, there was a volunteer at the obstacle. So after someone else came through and saw I was asleep down there, they would have just told the volunteer, and they would have pulled me from the course. Yeah. But... Everything in my brain was telling me, and this was the third place where I thought about quitting, was you just should go to sleep and be warm because you have shelter from the wind. And that was this, probably the scariest part for me because I, I stayed under the bridge for a solid 15 to 20 seconds thinking about it. I weighed my, my um, options really closely and I eventually decided to run. But it, that, was probably, that was probably the closest I could get to wanting to quit without quitting. But yeah, that was the darkest hour. So everything started improving. As I ran down, I started putting in some real speed downhill because I wanted to generate heat. The wind finally let up. And it, it was not long after the low crawl. Like the sun, the yeah. clouds parted and the sun came out. It was like, God, just was like, yeah. keep going, child. Like, you need to, you have to move. Or don't, this is no place to die. I, I know exactly <laughs> the, the feeling you're talking about. Yeah. Last year, when we were going up the mountain, we started in the dark. Yeah. And you climbed up and up and up with no sun and then there was this like line of light on the mountain and you crossed into it and you started getting warm it was a good time but i wasn't downhilling at full speed because my hands were inside the trash bag just trying to hold it through the glove i still hadn't put my gloves back on i just was trying to still move so i so i was a little off balance i was a little scared that if i fell that was going to be a pretty rough injury yeah you were gonna like but i didn't fall so yeah <laughs> so just don't fall and you're good and I felt really good on Monkey in the Middle for the first half. The first section, was, which was two sections of Twister. And then I transitioned to Monkey Bars. And I just kind of lost the ability to... to like the, I did the whole first Twister section without ever curling my right hand in. But yeah, Monkey in the Middle, um, I just locked up on the Monkey Bars. And once you lose momentum, yeah, and, 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 you're, and I was already really cold, it was kind of over. I think if I had been warm... Like, not even if I had more energy. If I had just been warmer... It would have been a piece of cake. Maybe, I think it was mostly my biceps that had given it. Also, because I, I manhandled that sandbag. So my biceps had gotten really shot on that sandbag carry from carrying it like that. It was just so rough. But the rest of the race was fine. I, there isn't too much to say. It did, the wind picked up a lot going up the mountain. And I remember at the water station 10, they had porta potties. And I remember I was so cold, I just, I got into a porta potty just, and I just, I had to regenerate heat and it was so warm in there. Yeah. It was actually so warm and nice. It did cost me probably, I would say 10 minutes of time. 10 minutes? Uh, well, I, I stayed in there for a good solid five, but to get back up to functioning yeah. performance, I think 10 is probably the amount, minutes is the amount of time I lost. Uh, but after that, it was just going down. And by the way, like the trash bag, you're, in some of the videos, you're probably seeing like the bag get in the way of the camera. I never took the bag off. But, and when I got to an obstacle, I raised it up around my neck and basically put it behind me <laughs> like a cape. 
And I just left it behind me as a cape. So when I do so, some of the obstacles, it went over me. Like on vertical cargo, when I flipped over, the bag completely went over my head. And I was like, ah, I can't. <laughs> I'm trapped. <laughs> um, uh, during the Hercules hoist, I remember the biggest problem. And I could actually, I actually pulled the rope down one-handed. So the Hercules hoist was pretty easy, I think. But I remember I had, I had to keep doing that because the bag kept getting over my head, like blowing over. I had to like pull it. At one point, I just shoved it into my mouth and stopped breathing on the Hercules so I could finish. Um, but yeah, it, it got to be super easy. And then they hit you with the second sand. <laughs> the God. second sandbag was 600 meters. And the first 300 meters were just straight back up the mountain. It was, right. it was a really brutal second sandbag. The, I knew it was rough because I picked the sandbag up, I put it on my shoulder, and then um, I took my hands off and immediately it just fell back. And I said, yeah. oh my God, that, that, like, that's how this is gonna go. So I just, but I, I just chugged through, uh, and then it was just a straight run up. You did Hercules, which I already talked about. It was a pretty easy Hercules. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it was like a beast level one, but it wasn't like the bags that soaked through yeah. or anything like that. So it was really just I finished the Hercules, put it down, I went across, and I immediately went inside. Like that's the first thing I did is I went inside. My my mom was like at the finish line, wondering where where I was because she saw me at Hercules. And I just said, no, I'm not waiting. Like, I, I need to get warm. Um, I don't think you were the only one to do that. Yeah, I, I did grab my fit aid. I wanted that fit aid. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it was um, it was super nice to finish. And I, I actually remember going to sleep, like, too hot. And I had I actually cracked the window in the hotel room because I just needed the cold. It reminded me of, if you ever watched the CW Arrow show, in the first season when he comes back oh, from Oh yeah, he's sleeping he, on the floor. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's just hurtled up under, under the floor as the rain comes in. And I imagine that's how I'm gonna be now, just with the cold. <laughs> My head's too warm inside. I can't sleep anymore. Your body temperature is like <laughs> permanently two degrees lower than what it used to be. Yeah, but yeah, I'm, I'm still super happy to have gone. It's, it's like my favorite thing to do. That race was less of what I like about Spartan races though in that I like the physically demanding and knowing yeah. to push yourself. This was it was a new challenge. It was pushing yourself through the cold and I'm happy to have gotten like the personal growth yeah. out of facing that level of cold like uh, basically tr approaching the edge of death by hypothermia and yeah. fighting through it just close enough cuz now I think I'm stronger for it. So I I still appreciate the challenge but it was definitely not my favorite race just this year. Last year Tahoe was great. I love Tahoe. So I don't think it's a bad video. It's just yeah. unfortunate weather. And um, so I, I remember I texted Mike like I don't really want to do that again anytime soon. Like I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna take some time off. I'm not gonna go to Worlds next year because I already want to do Killington and just like recover. But yeah, basically the, the synopsis of the race is it was really cool. Um, really but, cold. But, but it was a complete different challenge than your normal Spartan. It, again, like I said, Monkey in the Middle was not, you know, obviously, like, uh, hard is relative. Yeah. For, for me, when you're considering the caliber of athletes that were running at the World Championships, those are the top people. And so those people, it shouldn't have been that challenging of an obstacle, but just every single obstacle was harder because your hands were cold, your whole body, you were fighting hypothermia going through, the elevation got to you. As you always, were yeah. Traveling through so much. So it was definitely a more brutal race for reasons other than the reasons like West Virginia was for Yeah, they gave me the little coin. And I remember Mike, uh, so when you go, they give you a coin. And I'll go grab it, because I keep it right yeah. here. But you know, it says like, the 2019 Spartan World Championship Qualifier, you know, it has the trifecta on yeah. the back. So I think the color means age group, because the one I got last year was gold. goldish. Yeah. But I remember Mike got it his in the mail, and he sent me a yeah. photo, and I texted him, I want that. <laughs> I want one, yeah. and I have one now, <laughs> um, which was super. Which is super cool. This is um, this is one of the cooler things I own. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm super excited for that though. The the metal is also super yeah, cool. Yeah, and it's really actually, nice. This one actually has um, like Tahoe written. It's kind of hard to tell, but yeah, you know, 2019 Spartan World Championship North Lake Tahoe has like the trees and the mountains on it. Super cool metal. But yeah, so I have all my coolest medals of the year. Triathlon, yeah. West, my first triathlon, my first national Spartan, my first world championship Spartan, and then my second, my times two trifecta medal for yeah. the year. 
See, just a, just a year of cool things. Yeah. Doing cool stuff. But yeah, that pretty much wraps up the whole weekend. I think this was really good because in Kill after Killington, and I told Mike this at Hit the Bricks, like I I've, I've just lost my mojo. Yeah. Um, I you were, I, a, you were a broken man. Yeah, I mentally got broken by Killington because when I was thinking about the race this weekend, I was not thinking from a perspective of I get to race. It was more of I have to survive this race. Yeah. You know, it wasn't. I wasn't thinking about how well I was going to place. I was thinking about just not dying and, like, hopefully finishing. Yeah. Um, which, it kind of devolved into that a little bit this weekend. But I think, I know, finishing this race, now going back to the Ultra, the Ultra will be easier than this race, I think. Yeah. But, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all of Tahoe. That's, like, my takeaway. It was a really cool experience. Uh, one I'll probably remember for a while. Um, I am going to take a break from doing World Championship stuff because my goals right now are centered around um, ultras and the Ultra World Championships in particular for next year. That's what my main goals are. Week. That's all of it. And I guess the season's kind of coming to a close, so now we just look onwards and upwards to the Ultra. Yeah. So, yeah. I guess that's it.